Welcome to another episode of Open Mic, where we explore some of the professional pathways and amazing life experiences of some of the members of our diverse ANU College of Law alumni community. In today's episode, we talk to Lima Nguyen, Master of Laws graduate, and she shares with us her experience, her upbringing from being a refugee to being a award-winning barrister, how that affected her and impacted her life and her career, talks about a little bit about her experiences working with the victims of the Khmer Rouge, and she talks about how Master of Laws was so important for her. Finally, she talks to us about her future, what, what it holds for her and what she's up to next. So I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I did and stick around and watch this and yeah. Lima, welcome to Open Mic, and I guess for the benefit of our viewers, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, what you currently do, and what motivates you? Um, yes, thank you for the welcome, Mike. Um, so I practice as a barrister. I have um, my office in the Northern Territory. Um, I also practice internationally. I've practiced at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal uh, and I'm on the uh, council list for the International Criminal Court. Um, in my domestic practice, I do a lot of criminal law, um, both, um, you know, summary trial and appellate levels. And I'm on um, uh, civil inquiries such as Teachers Registration Board and the Local Government um, Disciplinary Committee. So my practice here is a little bit uh, mixed and I guess we're lucky in the Northern Territory because uh, of the small size of this jurisdiction. I think there's a lot more opportunity to, um, you know, dip your fingers in multiple pies, to put it that way. <laughs> awesome. Um, now I want to circle back real quick to your background, your upbringing. Your parents fled Vietnam and sought asylum and eventually started a new life here in Australia um, for their family for the family. Um, can you give us a bit of insight into how your background as a refugee kind of contributed to journey, to your journey into pursuing a career in, in law? Um, well, I think first of all, um, having a background as a Vietnamese and growing up in that sort of environment where when we came to Australia, we had absolutely nothing and we had to be very resourceful and make our own um, futures, our own work and our own destinies. Um, that kind of background has, um, I think, um, taught me to, um, you know, work hard, have good ethics um, and um, basically make your own way in the world. Um, but I also think that um, being a refugee, um, you know, and, and coming from that sort of background, you come to um, realise that, you know, anyone could have been in that situation and you kind of get a different perspective when you're looking at um, people and the human condition. Um, so that level of empathy, I think, for people and their situations, um, for other asylum seekers, um, is heightened because of that background of experience um, and I think that that creates the attitude to want to um, help other people. So law is one uh, mechanism for assisting other people in their times of uh, need. And I think, you know, law is where you come to the intersection of um, people uh, where their problems are, you know, life and death type situations or um, the... the um, more intense kind of human connections and human understandings can come from um, that sort of experience that people are going through. Um, so I think that there, there there's a, uh, a few different um, w uh, reasons why, you know, I was motivated to study law. Um, but with, with regards to being, to refugee law, I, I think it's um, particularly interesting because, um, you know, being a refugee is both a fact and it, it is a matter of law as well. And 
um, there's philosophical underpinnings as to, you know, what our moral obligations are um, and how that fits into the legal framework when it comes to, you know, um, uh, practising refugee law, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think there are um, um, multiple divergences um, that led me to um, ultimately study law. When did that light kind of click for you that, yep, I'm going to, you know, I want to become a lawyer, I want to do this? Um, was it any incident or was it any kind of like, uh, I don't know, I guess like growing up, like, did you always kind of want to be a lawyer? Um, no, I wanted to be lots of different things when I was um, growing up. But, um, and, and, you know, I didn't even start to study university doing law. Mm -hmm. I actually studied philosophy, peace and conflict studies, um, psychology, history, religion, just things that um, really um, made me think. And I, you know, have always been a little bit of a philosopher at heart. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was involved with um, a lot of um, humanitarian type NGOs uh, at university. I studied at the University of Queensland mm. um, and was involved as president of Amnesty International UQ chapter um, in my second year, um, which got me working a lot with, you know, the United Nations Students Association, um, Oxfam, uh, Red Cross and so on. And I think um, it really dawned on me at that point in time that, um, you know, you couldn't really be an armchair philosopher and, um, you know, um, see, see, make and see changes in the world. Um, you kind of need to be more at the front line um, or that's how, that's how I felt. So um, I got some advice from um, uh, uh, academics and um, um, was put onto a, uh, an army uh, general who advised me that if I if I wanted to, um, you know, be nice and fluffy, <laughs> then I can continue to do philosophy. But if I wanted to really make a difference, then I should study law. And so that's um, what uh, really dr drove me in part. That's that advice coming from um, from those people. Um, and you know, this was a, a time when. Um, uh, the United Nations was um, coming into East Timor to help mm -hmm. with the mission. Um, and I had been to East Timor a couple of times uh, in 2000 and then in 2002. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was seeing that kind of um, scenario um, firsthand and from at that young age um, felt like, yeah, I need, I need to study law if I'm going to do anything um, of use with um, you know, my education and my potential. Now, reflecting back on your time here at ANU Law, where you obtained your Master's of Law, International Law, um, why was it important for you to, to take that LLM course, uh, that LLM degree, and how did it help shape your path into, you know, currently what you're doing now? Mm. Um, look, I think if if you're going to be serious about um, practicing in international law, it is um, really important to pursue a master's degree, uh, a degree at that level, because uh, it's just so competitive out there. And these days, a law degree is um, uh, a bit like what an arts degree was, um, you know, a decade or so ago. Mm. Everyone's doing a law degree. Um, at that level, um, you need to have... Uh, a ho that higher um, qualification, I think. And, and, and that's pretty evident when, you know, you're working on the international stages and you see, you know, even at the internship level, uh, the level of competition is people with PhDs, um, people with masters, people who speak multiple languages. Um, so you need to be able to um, uh, acquire that, that level of qualification to even be competitive these days, in my view. Right, right, right. You know, when I was um, uh, doing my master's at ANU, I was actually doing it part-time whilst I was working mm. uh, initially at the Attorney General's Department and then at the Commonwealth uh, Director of Public Prosecution's Office. Mm. Um, so um, um, I think 
um, my memory of the Attorney General's department was, was that every young lawyer who started there had dreams of working in what they called OIL, the Office of International Law, and, um, you know, um, it, it, it was very common that people were pursuing PhDs and Masters to, um, to get a head up in terms of being able to transition to that place. Um, so it just all made sense to me. It, it also, I um, it enjoyed studying law. And um, when I was doing my undergraduate studies, I always enjoyed doing, you know, the international refugee law subjects, international humanitarian law. Um, and so it, it, um, was, it felt natural for me to want to um, pursue it further. Now, I want to talk about your career for a second. Um, one of the things you're known for is your work. Obviously, we mentioned this a bit earlier. It's your work representing the victims of um, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Can you share a little bit about that experience and how you got started on those cases? Um, yes, I got started on those cases back in 2008. Um, <clears throat> it was really, um, you know, when I look back at it, um, making connections with um, like-minded people who then um, grew an idea. Uh, at the time, I was connected with um, colleagues from Singapore who decided to do some pro bono work in Cambodia, mm -hmm. um, and I joined them in that quest. Um, the pro bono work that they were intending to do kind of shifted because when we went to Cambodia, um, basically on our scoping mission in 2008, um, what we found was that there was a gap um, in uh, legal representation for victims at the ECCC, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, um, <clears throat> because whilst the legislation which followed more the civil French law tradition, which yep. enabled victims to become plaintiffs or ci civil parties um, and have procedural rights um, alongside the prosecution and the defence in uh, bringing their claims uh, for moral and collective reparations to the tribunal, um, there was at the time not many lawyers um, representing the civil parties. And mm. the issue at that point in time was that um, given Cambodia's history, pretty much anyone who was over the age of 30 was a victim, uh, which meant that the scope of victims um, or civil parties was potentially, you know, in the thousands. Um, and as it turned out, um, there were 4,000 applications um, to for, for victims of crime to become uh, civil parties in that jurisdiction. So um, that's, how, that's how it sort of started. Um, the victims support section, as it was then known, of the tribunal was only starting to become operational. So my initial um, work in Cambodia was actually to do more with outreach to victims who lived in regional areas, working with NGOs to provide information to victims that they were entitled to um, apply to become a civil party and to let them know their procedural rights. Um, that then became, um, you know, outreach trips to um, regional areas. And in particular, I was put in touch with the ethnic Vietnamese who lived on the Tonle Sap um, River Lake. Um, so coming out there, collecting their stories, helping them to fill out victim information forms and then making um, submissions to the victim support section. Um, and so it was all, you know, procedural in the beginning. Um, it was about making sure that their um, stories were submitted, um, making sure that the victim support section was then processing those stories and um, passing them on to the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges, which then made the determination as to whether or not this person was admissible as a civil party with procedural rights in the tribunal. Um, so um, the, once, once the admissibility stage had passed and the trial phase um, was entered into, um, you know, the work kind of changed. So it became more like preparation for trial, um, choosing appropriate persons to um, put on a... Uh, witness list, mm -hmm. um, liaising with the um, prosecutors um, and ultimately preparing um, some of the clients to give evidence in court and also to prepare, um, you know, um, examination of other witnesses, what 
whilst the trial was uh, underway. Obviously, you've worked on this for a number of years. You've met a number of people along the way. Are there any particular moments that stood out to you in, you know, those conversations that you have with people um, in, in, in just working through these cases throughout the years? Um, yes, yes. I mean, I think um, um, the collection of stories from mm. victims um, uh, can can be very deeply entrenched in memory just because some of those stories are so horrific. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I found which made me feel closer to the case um, was the ability to speak to my ethnic Vietnamese client mm. in the Vietnamese language um, without the buffer of an interpreter. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, I guess, the concept of when you are able to see someone face to face and speak to them directly and connect with them directly. Um, again, the empathy levels go up. Um, you know, you, you really start to see um, their story from their own eyes mm. um, and so some of the stories that I heard um, you know they kind of stay with you yeah um, yeah I, I think that's um, uh, what comes to mind when answering that question yeah but for sure there's you know there, there are moments um, of gratitude from the um, victims themselves and and little instances um, that are very memorable in those outre outreach trips to their villages and things like that. Awesome. Okay, so now you are recognized at the ICC as a council able to defend persons accused of international atrocity crimes. Would you find it difficult to represent those cases having defended the rights of victims of mass crimes as you have at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal? I think um, one of the things that has sort of driven me or motivated me into law is um, you deal with cases that always um, expose you to the outer limits of the, uh, humanity. Um, you know, I, I think the, the important thing within the legal framework is um, when you're representing victims, um, you are giving them um, or manifesting the victim's rights to be heard, to be dealt with um, with dignity, um, to be compensated for wrongs done against them. Um, and there is a bigger moral in, impetus um, because this one, this is a person who's been wrong done by um, mm. and you want to... Um, um, manifest a remedy for them. Um, with representing defendants, which I do in domestic courts um, regularly, not mass crimes defendants, <laughs> obviously, yep. but you know, you, the, the, your role is to ensure that they have um, fair trial rights, yep. um, that there is a you know, balance in the way that um, the prosecution may be presenting um, a matter. Um, and that really it, it requires you to explore, again, the reasons why people do things, the circumstances that have led them to engage in per, um, particular conduct. Um, so I have not yet had the opportunity to um, represent a person who has been um, accused of mass atrocity crimes, but um, I think that the important thing is to provide the procedural rights that um, operate within the legal framework. And um, again, you know, the thing that fascinates me, both um, on the idea of representing victims or representing defendants, um, is coming face to face with um, that humanity and the human conditions that, um, you know, explain why people do the things that they do. 
obviously you've been doing this a long time. You've had a, a long career, very eventful career, successful career, um, if I may say so. What advice would you give students who, you know, once they once they're finished with uni, they're entering like this whole new world. You know, all of them wants to stand out and make a difference. What advice would you give to to these um these kids finishing uni? Mm. Well, first of all, I think it's really important to um, engage in um, things that um, demonstrate character uh, building. So um, if I was to look at, um, you know, a, a set of CVs and to re uh, recruit someone to practice with me, for example, I'd want to see that the person has um, um, a, a bit of life experience um, and done things uh, that um, explore or touch upon, you know, um, the limits of, the, of who they are. You know, something like travelling um, is a really good way of, well, not, you can't really travel these days. <laughs> but, you know, there are things that, that um, strike out at an application um, and I always look at the person. Um, you know, I... I but I think it's really important to be able to demonstrate that you're able to um, critically think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, you know, master's degree or higher education is one way that that can manifest. Um, but I also think it's really important for, for young people to, t um, to take opportunities, which includes doing pro bono work, um, to branch out and to explore for themselves what it is that they want to do because when you're um, just graduating um, you're usually very very susceptible at, to um, to engaging in whatever it is that comes um, it more immediately to you and I'm talking about my own um, you know inclinations when I was just mm -hmm. coming out of law school um, you know I remember doing an internship at the Legal Aid Commission in Queensland and I just thought oh this is what I want to do with my life and then I'd do um, you know a legal support role at the DPP and then I'd be well this is what I want to do with my life and then I did an internship in um, Singapore at a commercial firm and thought yeah I can see myself doing this so you've got to explore a lot of different things to kind of come to exactly what it is that suits you mm. um, and um, reaching out, taking opportunities, making your own destiny um, uh, and demonstrating a um, broader, um, you know, angles um, to who you are is really important, I think, in the market these days. Awesome. Uh, Lima, that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing some of your, you know, some of your stories of your journey with us. Um, I wish you nothing but the best moving forward. Um, I hope you get to keep doing the great things that you're doing. And um, yeah, all, all the best. And um, we, I hope to hear more about you in the future. Thanks very much, Mike. My pleasure.